Hi, I'm Tom Greenwood, and I'm going to talk to you today about sustainable web design for everyone. So the web is something that most of us tend to think of as something that isn't really physical. It doesn't really exist. It's We use words like cloud to describe where we store our data. It's all just sort of vapors up there in the sky somewhere. And we use up words like virtual to describe the things that we do online. But the web is in fact a very real thing. And although it might not seem intuitive, it actually does have a real physical impact on the environment. The web is actually the biggest machine that humans have ever created. The internet consists of billions of end user devices, thousands of data centers around the world, vast amounts of cable and transmission repeater stations all over the world, sending data to every single little location where people are consuming data and using the web. And all of this is consuming electricity and it's consuming electricity 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. And when we actually put that in terms of carbon emissions from the electricity production, we find that the internet has a carbon footprint roughly equivalent to that of Germany, which is the seventh most polluting country in the world. And I think perhaps more surprisingly, it's roughly equivalent to global aviation. And there's a huge amount of public awareness around the environmental impact of aviation and the need to decarbonize aviation as an industry and to do so rapidly. But there's almost no conversation at all about there even being an environmental impact of the internet and digital technology. And I think this needs to change because these things are roughly equivalent and we need to take it seriously. As a forward-thinking, future-focused industry in digital, we need to be at the forefront of actually making sure our own industry is the solution and not the problem to climate change and other environmental issues. The good news is that unlike aviation, it's a lot easier to decarbonize the internet than it is to decarbonize aeroplanes. Now, these emissions are coming from essentially three places. It's the energy and manufacture and operation of data centers, of transmission networks and end user devices. And these are the same places, therefore, that those of us who actually design the software side of the web can actually help to save energy. We can help to save energy in data centers by reducing server load. We can help to save energy in transmission networks by reducing the amount of data that has to be transferred to and from users between data centers and between each other. And we can help reduce energy consumed on end user devices. And when we do this, we're going to get a number of benefits. We're going to help the environment by reducing energy consumption. We're also going to help improve web performance, which has a number of benefits, including potentially improved search engine rankings, potentially increased conversion rates. And we're also going to improve user experience, not just in terms of the conventional uh, metrics of, con of user experience, but also in terms of accessibility and inclusivity. And we'll see some of this as we go through this presentation. So how do we actually go about doing this? Let's look at a few of the things that we can actually do to take practical steps to reduce energy consumption and hopefully also benefit the people who are using the services that we design. Now, the first thing I'd recommend is to actually look at user journeys and how can we streamline them? This might seem like something that's quite far away, far removed from sustainability as a concept, but actually streamlined user journeys are really at the kind of the foundation of creating more efficient digital products. The more time that we spend online, the more energy we're consuming. So if we have to spend time trying to do things that are difficult, looking for things that are hard to find, we're literally wasting energy. We're not just wasting our own time or, or our user's time, we're wasting energy we're producing emissions unnecessarily. But also, when we have to go to new pages, the more pages we have to load, the more data has to be consumed and the more energy is used. So streamlining user journeys is a really effective way at a foundational level, at a design level of reducing energy consumption and making life better for everybody who uses those services. The example on the screen here is the Finisterre website. And I think it's a really nice example of a very simple feature that helps streamline the user journey because on the right hand side, you'll see this shopping basket 
which actually just slides in and out from the right hand side of the screen. You can view it at any time on any page. It's always there for you. And this is a nice contrast to a lot of e-commerce websites where if you're trying to buy multiple things on the same user journey, you might put things in your basket and forget what's there. I do this a lot whenever I'm using an e-commerce website. And I often put things in my basket as well that I might not be sure if I want to buy, but I think I, I want to save them somewhere so that I can make a decision later. So I'll add them to my basket and make a decision later. But that means that we have to keep going back and forth to the shopping cart page. It wastes time, it wastes data, and sometimes we forget where we were on our user journey, which wastes even more time and ends up with us having to go back to the beginning, starting again to find where we were. So this Ajax shopping cart that slides in and out, it's a really nice, simple example of streamlining user journeys. Now, from a pure data point of view, the single biggest use of data on most websites is photography, images. Image files tend to be quite large compared to other types of files on a website. And so we really should look at how we can reduce this because if we can reduce data, we can reduce energy consumption. So really asking ourselves whether we can actually use less images. Like yes, a picture can paint a thousand words, but we should ask ourselves whether it's really doing that. Is it really helping tell an important story? Or is it just filling space? And if it's filling space, could we get rid of it and actually just design the website so that when we don't have a space that needs filling, or maybe we just leave the space. Space is good. It helps the website to breathe. It helps people's minds to absorb the information that's actually important. So using less images is really, really something that we should focus on in design. But if we do need to create visual interest, then we can look at other options. We can look at what, what can we do with CSS just in terms of color and animation and shape. And then if we want more advanced shapes, what can we do with vector graphics? With SVG files can be really, really efficient in terms of what they can communicate in very, very small files. And the example on the screen here is the Rights for Children website, which is a children for it's a website for children living in institutional care in the UK. It's a really underprivileged group. And they have very limited, or well, potentially very limited access to data. So it's really important that this website is very, very data efficient in order to make it accessible to them. But that also has a knock-on effect in other areas such as web performance and reducing energy consumption. And the way this is achieved is by actually avoiding photography altogether. There's not a single photograph on this website, but it's really vibrant and visually interesting. This is all done with CSS for color and animation, and then cartoons and shapes created with SVG graphics. And these cartoons help tell the story and help make this very dry, serious content engaging and accessible to a young audience. But let's say that we do actually have a genuine use case for photography and we want to look at, could we actually design the, our websites to use photography more efficiently? And the answer is yes. This image fills my entire screen and saved at 80% quality. It's from Photoshop, it's 1.2 megabytes. That's huge. I mean, that's, that's almost an entire floppy disk's worth of data, if you remember <laughs> floppy disks. And it's, I mean, you could build a whole web page in far less than this single image. And the problem with full screen images is where do you put everything else without either ruining the image or distracting from what you're trying to communicate? If we wanted to put text on this as a web page, where would the text go? We're either going to put it over the top of the image and ruin the image or have to put a box there somewhere. It's very, very awkward from a design point of view to actually create something that's really readable, really engaging. And so we've got this big file and it's slightly awkward from, you know, in terms of actually communicating anything useful. What about if we halved the size of the image in terms of its pixel dimensions? Halving the size of the image creates space, space that we can use to let people's minds breathe, but also to put other information on the page. And an image half the size, 640 by 400 pixels, is only 360 kilobytes. That's a huge saving. So there's like real, like multiple benefits to doing this. But if you look at the image on the right, I've taken it a step forward, forward and I've actually blurred the images of this image and left the horse in focus. 
And blurring the edges of the image has brought the file size down from 360 kilobytes to 192 kilobytes, another huge saving. And the image is the same pixel dimensions. And the reason for this is simply because detail is data and data is energy. So we're reducing detail, we're reducing energy consumption. We don't necessarily even have to blur the edges of this image. We could think of other effects. So for example, we could have cut this horse out and put it on a plain color background or some sort of simplified graphic background. There are many creative options. We really should think creatively about how can we actually reduce the amount of detail in our images in order to reduce data consumption and hopefully also make things more beautiful, tell a better story in the process. Another way that we can actually reduce the amount of de detail in the image is by removing the color. So actually color is a form of detail. Black and white images are even smaller. So this black and white image is now 129 kilobytes, roughly 10% of the size of the original full screen color image. And you don't have to use black and white. You could use any other form of monochrome or duotone, anything that reduces the amount of color detail. You can get really creative with this. Um, it's definitely worth exploring. But even if we design our images to be as small and efficient as they can possibly be, we can still make them even more efficient by choosing the right file type. So WebP images are roughly 30% smaller than JPEG images for the same visual quality. And they have 96% global browser support, which is huge. We should really be looking at, you know, making WebP standard across the web. But AVIF images, which are relatively new, are actually even smaller. They're roughly half the size of JPEG images. And they already have 67% global browser support and rising. So I think this is one to watch for the future. It's definitely an area where we could save a huge amount of data and energy and make the web faster in the process. Now, having said that images are one of the biggest sources of data consumption on most websites, that's assuming that you're not using video. If you are using video, then it's going to blow everything else out of the water. And the worst possible case of using video is autoplay, because then means that every single visitor to that web page is going to play the video, whether they like it or not, whether it's useful to them or not. So this is going to consume huge amounts of data, which is bad for the environment, but it's also really bad for users because you're burning through their data without their permission. They don't even necessarily know that this is going to happen. They just have clicked on a link somewhere or they typed in your URL and the video starts playing itself automatically and burning through their data without them even really realizing it's about to happen. And this is going to impact the people on the lowest incomes the most because people on high incomes with unlimited data plans, it might be annoying from a, the point of view of load times and slowing the website down, but they don't necessarily care about how much data it's using, but it's the people on the lowest incomes who have limited data. It's expensive relative to the amount of income that they have who are really being penalized unfairly by autoplay videos. So lots of reasons not to use autoplay videos, and I would highly urge them to be avoided at all costs. But one of the areas that what we should look at if we are going to use video is just compress the video files as much as possible stream at the lowest definition that we can. So do we need ultra high definition? Do we need high definition? Is standard definition enough? In many cases, the answer is probably yes. And reducing the time of videos. Time is going to be proportional to the amount of data consumed. And I think in most cases, users are also going to appreciate it if we use these, if we use their time sparingly. If we keep the content really, really concise, it's going to be good for them. It's going to save data. It's going to save energy. It's a win-win for everybody. Now, there's one thing on the web that is truly free, and that is system fonts. System fonts are the fonts that are already on your device, whether it's a Windows computer, a Mac, an Android phone, whatever it happens to be, there are fonts already preloaded on your device. And these can be used, whether it's Arial, Times New Roman, Georgia, Roboto, there's a whole bunch of them. Windows even has a font called System that's actually quite a beautiful font and very rarely used. They're worth looking at. I know designers tend to cringe whenever I mention system fonts, but they are really, really efficient. It means that you don't have to load font files onto the user's device in order to render the text. 
Hotels.com is a hugely successful online business that, as far as I'm aware, they only use system fonts. And although I'm pretty sure they're not doing this for environmental reasons, I think it's probably also fair to assume that they are doing it for efficiency reasons, because a lot of their users are going to be out and about on a trip, traveling, looking for somewhere to stay. So they're probably using a mobile device, possibly in a foreign country where their data may be really expensive on a roaming plan. And so using system fonts helps reduce data consumption. It improves load times. It's a really good thing for the user. It's a really good thing commercially for Hotels.com in this case, and it helps save energy. But if we do want to use custom fonts or specific web fonts, then there are things that we can do to actually reduce the amount of data that they're using. So the first thing that we could do is make sure that we're using the WAF2 file format, which a bit like WebP or AVIF, in photography and, and images, it's just the most efficient file format compared to, for example, WAF or GTF format. But we can also subset fonts. So we don't necessarily need to load an entire font. We can actually just load the characters that we're going to use. So most font files will actually contain characters that are never used in the English language. Or if your website's in another language, you can subset just down to that language. And we can also use fewer weights. So every weight of a font that we need to load often requires another font file. So if you want bold or heavy or light or super light or whatever the different weight of the font might be, you're having to load additional font files for all of these weights. So designing to use the minimum amount of weights is really, really um, a good way of saving data and also saving the number of requests that have to be made to the server. Or if you do need a lot of different weights in your design, using a variable font could be a really efficient option. So you've just got one font file and then you can specify it, tell the browser how thick to display um, the text. And if you look at the example in the table on this page, into UI, which is an open source fault font, as a TTF file, one weight comes with 2,192 characters and, and it's around 300 kilobytes. If we convert this to a WAF2 file, we with just English specified as a language, we get this down to 98 characters and seven kilobytes. That's a huge saving. And it's really interesting to see that actually the English language with all of its, you know, just the letters, the numbers and the special characters, we only need about 100 characters, not 2000. So there's huge amounts of data to be saved in optimizing our fonts. We can also look to save energy in terms of the colors that we use on websites. Now, this does not apply to all devices. It only applies to devices using OLED screen technology, but this is becoming more and more common. And no doubt at some point in the future, it will be the standard for most devices. OLED screens are effectively made up of millions of tiny LED light bulbs and that light up individually. And what this means is that actually when you've got a white screen, all of those light bulbs are on at maximum brightness. And when you've got a black screen, they're effectively, all of the light bulbs are switched off. And this means that actually darkening your color palette can help you to reduce the amount of energy being used by the screen. The darker it is, the less energy it's gonna use is a good rule of thumb. Weirdly, blue pixels use more energy than green and red pixels. So if you do have control over the color palette, which you may not, you may have to follow certain brand guidelines, but if you do have control over the color palette, actually designing um, designing to avoid pure blue as much as possible and steering the color palette towards other areas of the spectrum is also gonna help you save energy. Another area that we should look at, I think, is tracking, because tracking is really kind of a bad thing in many ways, not just in terms of privacy, in terms of user experience with these ghastly cookie banners, but also from, a, from an energy point of view and from a data consumption point of view. We have to load tracking scripts. So that's a data that has to be consumed just to load the tracking script, which is then gonna invade people's privacy and harvest their data and slow the website down. But once it's on their device, it's using more energy to do the harvesting of their data. And once it's harvested their data, it's then using more energy to send that data back to the data center, where it's then using more energy to actually keep it stored forever on a hard drive somewhere. And it may not even ever actually be looked at. So there's just energy being used everywhere. It's invading privacy. We should really question this. And actually the less 
tracking that we do, the less we have to do in terms of invasive cookie banners, and the more we can respect people's privacy. If we look at some like typical tracking scripts, we find that there are real opportunities for saving and uh, data and energy and improving privacy right out of the box. Google Analytics is 17 kilobytes and it uses cookies, so which means you need a cookie banner. Google Analytics, if you add Google Tag Manager, bumps up to about 75 kilobytes. It's getting quite big. Matomo is an open source option. It's 40 kilobytes, still also quite big. But then there's some really interesting th options. Minimal Analytics is only one and a half kilobytes, and it's basically a stripped down Google Analytics script in just one and a half kilobytes. That's a really good saving. If you think about the number of web pages that are using Google Analytics, if all of them switched to minimal analytics, how much data that would save every day across the world. Really good saving in data. They still use cookies though, so you still need the cookie banner. Fathom is even smaller, 1.2 kilobytes, doesn't use cookies, it's a privacy focused analytics script and so you don't need the cookie banner. And plausible, I think amazingly, less than a kilobyte for the tracking script. And again, it's privacy focused, doesn't use cookies, really, really good option. This is good, you can get meaningful data that you need for your marketing campaigns without invading people's privacy, without necessarily cons uh, harvesting more data than you need they just track kind of fairly central metrics and you're saving energy in the process definitely good things to look at you can also look at what programming languages we're using it, you might be surprised to hear that different programming languages actually use significantly different amounts of energy to perform the same task the most efficient programming languages are c rust and c plus plus the least energy efficient are Perl, Python, and Ruby. And the differences are pretty vast. Out of all of the kind of mainstream web languages, JavaScript is pretty much the most efficient. And it's seven times more energy efficient than PHP and 16 times more energy efficient than Ruby. It means that you're doing the same task in Ruby, you'd literally use 16 times more energy. Now, of course, we don't always have choice over this. We it's not necessarily easy to learn new languages. We might be inherently have to use a specific technology because the project we're working on uses that technology. We don't necessarily have a choice, but where we do have a choice, this is something to think about. Um, particularly if we're looking at learning new languages or we're starting a new project where we actually have some freedom over the technology, this is really worth bearing in mind and looking at how can we actually shift the trajectory of the types of languages that we're using towards the lower end of the energy spectrum. Now, I really want to just give a mention to this idea of not drugging the user. And I know that there's, in most cases, none of us are actually trying to drug the user, but we should be really mindful of where we might be doing this by accident. Things like use of notifications on apps and websites, um, use of infinite scroll, autoplay content. These are things that like lure the user in, make it hard for the user to leave. We commonly in sort of marketing circles use terms like sticky. And, you know, these are great from a marketing point of view. But what does sticky really mean? Sticky means that you're making it difficult for somebody to leave even if they want to. It means that you're, on some level, you're keeping them as a psychological prisoner of your service. And we should really, really like be mindful of this and actually start to look and say, okay, yes, there might be some big tech companies that are doing this on purpose and they're designing their applications to be addictive. They're dis intentionally drugging users. But the vast majority are not doing that. But we may be doing it by accident. Let's be really mindful of this. Let's actually look at the, the things we're designing ourselves and say, are we, are we doing things that might accidentally be making things stickier than they need to be against the best interests, the, against the mental health interests of the user? And in the process, actually getting them to consume a lot more data, consume a lot more energy because they're staying on these services longer. They're loading more content and more content. They're finding it hard to actually put the device down and walk away. And we can also look at this the other way. So designing for the environment can help us actually make things better from an inclusivity and an accessibility point of view. 
But actually, looking at it the other way and saying, well, if we, what about if we d intentionally design for the less privileged? This can also help us make savings for the environment too. So this is a great tool. What does my site cost? You can put any URL in there. And it actually gives you information about what that website costs in different countries around the world. And you can view it as both in pure kind of dollar amounts, but also as a percentage of local incomes. And this is really, really interesting because it helps us to understand that bloated web pages are actually really costing people money, um, particularly in poorer parts of the world. If we've got a global audience and we want to make our content accessible to a wide audience, then we we should be trying to use the smallest amount of data possible. When we do this, it's going to be good for everybody. But we should not just look at the um, not just look at the software side. Actually, looking at the hardware side helps us to understand that, that there's um, more reasons to do this. The average device in the world right now is this Motorola with about two gig of RAM. It's actually like, it looks okay on paper. If you just sort of glance at the spec, you might not think much of it, but actually it's a painfully slow device compared to the devices that most of us are probably using today. This is the average device globally. It's, I think it's the Motorola E6. It costs about $150. And as the average device, if you actually think about that, that means that roughly half of the world's internet users are using something that's worse than this. So this is the sort of device that we should really be testing on um, to find out what it's like for people to use the services that we're building. We shouldn't be using necessarily an iPhone 10 or you know, latest Samsung Galaxy. We should be using something like this or worse. Alex Russell, who was an engineer at Google, he's just moved to Microsoft, I believe, has been studying this for several years, looking at like what, how does web performance affect people in different parts of the world? And one of the things that he said in his latest report is that things continue to get better and better for the wealthy, leaving the rest behind. And what he means by this is that actually the performance improvements from one generation of device to the next are the top end of the market. So from one iPhone to the next iPhone to the next iPhone, or from one Samsung Galaxy to the next generation and the next generation, those performance improvements are actually can be quite significant. But at the lower end of the market, people who are buying devices like this, actually the performance improvement from one generation to the next is negligible. They're really like that the, the technology is not filtering down that quickly. They're just repackaging the same old technology and selling it again and again, which means that the disparity between the people with the latest devices and the people on low incomes is getting bigger and bigger. He said in his conclusion that for modern web pages, looking at a global audience, half a megabyte is a decent hard budget. Now think about that. The image I showed earlier of the horse full screen was 1.2 megabytes. He's saying that a, a hard budget for an entire web page, everything included tracking scripts, content, should be about half a megabyte. Um, you know, we should really, looking at this can help us to really focus our minds on how we need to cut down on data and design it out and make things super efficient. Now, these are all things that we can do in design and development, but we should also look at the hosting that we're using and the environmental impact of our services can be significantly impacted by the type of hosting that we're using. One of the first things to look at is whether they have a commitment to using renewable energy, because actually, unlike aviation that I mentioned earlier, which is really hard to decarbonize, one of the ways that we're going to decarbonize the Internet is by powering it entirely by renewable energy. And actually, data centers are one of the kind of key points where we can have some control over this. It's very hard for us to control the energy used by the transmission networks. We don't really know where it goes between the data center and the end user. And it's very hard for us to control the energy used by end users to power their devices. It's a distributed global system. But we do often have choice over which data centers we use, and we can shop around to find ones that use renewable energy. And well, this is a bit of a minefield once you get into it. Firstly, just ask the question. If they don't know the answer, then they're almost certainly not using renewable energy and we should look elsewhere. If they do know the answer, then that's great. That's a huge step forward. There's a big tick in the box. But we could potentially ask them some more detailed questions if we wanted to. Do they have a direct renewable energy connection? 
that's great. That's top of the list. If they don't, do they have local contracts with local renewable energy generators that are on the same grid as them? If not, what are they doing? Are they buying renewable energy credits? Are they buying carbon offsets? Basically, the higher up this list they are, the more meaningful that is. Um, anywhere on this list is better than nothing, but really what we want is for them to have local energy contracts or direct re renewable energy feeds. But we can also get other benefits from an environmental point of view in our hosting. For example, server caching can not only improve web performance, reduce load times, but it can also reduce consumption because it means that pages are pre-generated. The computers in the data center are not having to think about how to build the page every single time somebody requests it. CDNs can help potentially save energy, um, moving the data, moving the assets closer to the end user, reducing the distance that that data has to travel, um, and also potentially doing things like providing firewalls that actually um, keep load, keep spam traffic away from the server helping to save energy. Static web technology is really interesting and this is something that doesn't necessarily have to tie in with the hosting but some hosts are now starting to offer static generators for or static conversion tools for uh, traditional content management systems like WordPress for example which can help us save energy and make them faster and more secure. And then we also have scalable cloud services that mean that we don't necessarily need to have lots of big servers sitting there waiting just in case we have a traffic spike, but we can actually scale the amount of server resources based upon the amount of traffic that hits at any point in time. And Cloudflare Workers is a really good example of that. A few resources that I would advise looking at if you're interested in this topic um, first of all, website carbon.com is a tool that our team developed a few years ago. This is version two, and we're currently working on version three, um, where you can put in the URL of any web page and get an estimate for the amount of energy consumed by that web page and the amount of CO2 emissions produced. So it's a fun tool to sort of play around with and get a sense of the websites that you use or look at your competitors or others in the industry. Start to get a sense of how well do they perform? How polluting are they? Um, blatant, <laughs> blatant plug, I've written a book on this, uh, Sustainable Web Design, available from bookapart.com. Um, so if you really want to go kind of a bit deeper, then uh, check out the book, available as print or ebook. A tool that I'd recommend looking at is in the Safari browser. So unfortunately, only available if you're on a Mac. But the Safari browser is the only browser I'm aware of that has an energy impact tool. Um, so in the dev tools, there's an in energy impact monitor where you load the page and it will give you an indication of how much CPU energy is being consumed and also an indication of what it is that's consuming um, the CPU resources. So this is really good if you want to start digging in and fine tune how, how we're using the web and what it's doing on the end user's device. Um, you know, what impact does that CSS animation have or that JavaScript animation have on CPU usage? These are things you can actually start testing, playing around with using the Energy Impact tool. Um, the Sustainable Web Manifesto, um, very simple to go and read and sign if this is something that you believe in. Um, sort of some key principles to really think about in every, every project that you're doing on the web. We have a newsletter um, comes out every month where we're reporting on um, reporting on all of the good things happening on the web in terms of making it more environmentally friendly. Curiously Green uh, is the name of the newsletter. You can find it in the footer of the Whole Digital website. If you're doing exciting projects in this area, if you've found ways of actually reducing energy consumption, or if you've written content about this topic, please do share it. Um, the more that we can talk about this topic, the more that we can share this with each other, the more we can share knowledge, share ideas, raise awareness, the faster we're going to decarbonize the internet. So it's really, really important to get the word out. Webdesign.org is a website with a um, huge volume of strategies that you can follow to actually make websites better for both people and planet. It's a really good resource. Go and check it out and browse through and see if there's strategies that you can incorporate into your web projects. And finally, the Green Web Foundation a website is also really worth checking out. They've got the largest database of green web hosts, I think, anywhere around currently. So if you're looking for a green host, 
go and check out their directory, which is um, lists all of the hosts that have been approved by them as being powered by renewable energy. Um, but they also have a tool where you can put in a URL and test it. So if you want to find out like whether your host is green or not, it's a good tool to use and um, perhaps start a conversation with your hosting company. If you've tested it and it doesn't come out as green, perhaps contact your hosting company and ask them. Um, it's a good way of starting that conversation. Thank you very much for your time. I really hope that this talk has got you interested, not just in like raising awareness about the topic of sustainability and digital, but how if we take practical steps to reduce energy consumption on the web, we can actually create a web that's better for people too. It's a win-win for everybody sides. And I think we could create, create a really great future online. If you do want to contact me about any of this, um, email me tom at wholegraindigital.com, Twitter at eatwholegrain or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for your time.